And welcome back to Let's Play Out of the Park Baseball 25, trying to rebuild our Oakland days, and we think this could be our year. This is what, the eighth? The ninth season? I have been the GM slash manager of the Oakland A's, and we had a big offseason. We are coming off of a big offseason. Particularly, our focus was building around the guys who got us there last year. So last year, we played close to 500 ball. We won 79 games. We kept the players who were good for us, and we shift off those who were not so good for us. And that was basically the goal of the offseason, keep the guys around who actually help us win games. Here is our GM report card. It shows us our best trades by war, our worst trades by war, our best acquisitions and greatest losses. Our greatest loss remains Mason Miller, who is now going to be the closer for the San Francisco Giants. I want to point out our best acquisition of this entire save so far and also the best uh, trade so far, Josh Mears. We trade for Josh Mears at the beginning of 2025. He went on to have a pretty solid career for us, I guess, but uh, really apart from 2029, a little bit disappointing. You can see led the American League in strikeouts four times, a lot of red ink there in that column. And ultimately, we decided to move on from him. He was actually one of the higher paid players on our team, despite taking a relatively team-friendly extension. DL Hall's gone, Pasquantino's gone, Shimizu is now gone, Cop's been gone, Melendez is now gone. So really, Chris Baker's the guy we're kind of building the team around. Just signed him to a big extension. He looks like a terrific player for us out there in center field. We do have a new worst trade. It was a trade I conducted last year. Traded away Connor Griffin, Noah Miller, and Fabian Lopez for Dave Sochi. Dave Sochi was replacement level, essentially. He'll actually start the season on the injured list, which opens up just a little bit of playing time for Andrew Wiggins, who's trying to avoid basically a DFA. But Griffin... Here are his stats from uh, last year. Uh, Noah Miller, his stats from last year. He's now a Toronto Blue Jay. And then Fabian Lopez. So it looks bad, but it's just a bunch of one more players, you know. So we'll just have to see. If Griffin turns into a great player, then it's obviously going to be a, bit, uh, a bad trade. But uh, until then, that is our GM report card. I try to keep you all somewhat updated as far as league-wide transactions go, so we'll go over some trades from this past offseason. Arizona has traded for Andres Jimenez. That is a big acquisition for them. They have remained active in the trade market. Here's Andres Jimenez. They also traded away starting pitcher Yumin Lin to the New York Mets for some prospects in return. Yumin Lin, a one-time Cy Young winner in this save back in 2026 and still a very good pitcher. Taj Bradley is a Philly now. He was previously a Baltimore Oriole. He still has two years remaining on his contract. Camilo Doval has been one of the best relievers throughout this simulation. He was previously with Cleveland. Now he will join Minnesota for the last year of his deal. You can see a .82 ERA in 2030, 1.54 in 2031. And finally, Logan Ohapi leaves the Angels. He's going to join the Braves. Here are his career stats. He's been a very good catcher throughout this save, very productive, and he will be a Brave for the last year of his contract. We'll have a full prospect check-in later on in this video, but I do want to point out where a few guys will be starting. Dave Morrell was our big international uh, amateur free agent signing from this past winter, not yet ready for pro ball. He will start in the international complex, only 16 years old. Juan Bustios is our biggest prospect, according to the rankings at least. He will start in Arizona, not yet ready for full season A ball, at least with regards to his ratings. The guys who are closer to the big leagues are who I really want to focus on here. We've got a couple guys in AA who I think could have very well started in AAA. One of those is Sergio Treviso. We're excited about him. He could potentially factor in this year, given the question marks in terms of corner outfield. Chris Rangel was our 2031 first rounder, second overall in the draft. College starting pitcher, and uh, he's going to start the season in AA. Had a very nice debut in high A last year after being drafted. And then uh, the, the guy I'm probably most excited about is Mike Drake because Mike Drake has evolved a lot in terms of the ratings. And in some of these ratings, I would say, I would argue, uh, he is big league ready and his ex expectations to be playing in the majors. He's going to start in double A just because we haven't played him above high A, but uh, he will probably be you know in triple A very, very soon. He may only pitch a month in double A. And then moving on to AAA here, we have some guys ready to make an impact. I think if there were ever some issues with the uh, middle infield, which, you know, there could be some injuries there with Tovar, uh, you know, Daniel Arana would be a guy we could call on. He was our first round 2029. Just hasn't developed as a hitter really at all since being drafted. It's been a huge bummer. You can see he did not perform in AAA. So he may actually not be called up. It may be Mauricio Alboran or some sort of platoon. Mauricio Alboran, our 2029 fifth rounder, has progressed more with the bat than uh, Daniel Arana. But the real guy to be excited about is Jared Forrest. Jared Forrest, we're just waiting. He's just biding his time. He will be the starting catcher sooner rather than later. However, we will open the season with Carter Jensen serving that role. 
And finally, here are your preseason predictions for 2032 before we get here into opening day. We are projected to win 83 games. If we do that, we will have a winning record. It'll be our first winning record since I took over to actually be the Oakland A's first winning record since 2021. So that would be over a decade since they last had a winning season. If the win distribution shakes out like this in the American League, we would miss the playoffs by one game. We'd miss that uh, third wildcard spot by one game to the Boston Red Sox. I definitely think that shows that we are in line to be in contention for a wildcard spot and to being above 500 team. Looking at the top hitters and top projected pitchers in the American League, we do have Chris Greer here, and that is a nice surprise for us. He was a big player development lap success first the offseason, added a lot of power, and he's going to be key for us. He's going to bat cleanup uh, with Daniel Cuvet batting third. Here's how the projections look for the National League. Their best projected position player is James Wood. Their best pitcher is uh, C.J. Sampson, who's a two-way player, so the Washington Nationals looking good. Although the Miami Marlins, a good young team, projected at 91 wins. Brewers and Giants expected to win their respected divisions. We will be facing off against the Baltimore Orioles on opening day. They are led by their ace pitcher, Joel Demosthene. I, I don't know how to say that. It sounds Greek to me, but he's only 23. Looks like he is an ace or is going to be an ace. Looks like an absolute monster pitcher for them. And given that he is a lefty, he will face our lefty lineup. That is going to include Ezekiel Tovar moving up and Chris Greer moving down. Junior Arias is going to get the start. He is going to make his big league debut in this one. And Carter Wong gets the start as well against the left-handed pitcher. Tyler Pitzer will be our new opening day starter coming off an ERA crown in 2031. There is a buzz in the Coliseum that hasn't been there since this save began as Tyler Pitzer takes the mound on opening day. He will face Pete Crow Armstrong, who strikes out to begin the season. Kobe Mayo up to the plate with a runner on and two outs in the bottom of the first. And that ball is going to get past Wong. So that will advance the runner to scoring position. Mayo still at the plate, full count, and he's going to strike out. Pitzer gets through the first inning clean. Mark Cox is our third baseman. He will lead off the bottom of the second. Oh, and he's going to crank one. That one was hit hard. Will it stay in? No, it will not, folks. That one will leave the yard. A home run for Mark Cox, 399 feet, and that is our first run of the season. Back to the top of the order here in the bottom of the third. That's going to be Tremar Johnson leading off. Had a single in his first at bat, and this one is going to the gap. And uh, it is going to get away from the center fielder, Crow Armstrong. So that is going to be a leadoff double for Tamar Johnson. And we have a new scoring threat in this inning for Chris Baker, who strikes out. Not an easy guy to strike out. Next up is Ezekiel Tovar. And Tovar hits one to the gap. And that will get down. The question is, will Johnson score? And as he comes home, the answer will be yes. Two runs for us so far. Next up is Daniel Cuvet, who is going to strike out. No, sorry, not strike out. Uh, a throw down a first. Cuvet still batting here. 2-2 two -two count. And he will strike out looking that time. And with two outs, it's going to be Mark Cox, who homered in his previous at bat. And he's going to strike out with through three. We lead 2 to nothing. Pitzer at just 71 pitches is on for the sixth. He will lead off against Pete Crow Armstrong as we go through the third time through the order. And he will get a strikeout on Armstrong. Next up is going to be Pat Martin. He's going to hit an infield pop-up. That is going to be caught, I believe that's Holiday. No, excuse me, Tovar makes the play. And then next is Gunnar Henderson, full count. He's going to hit one really hard, but Cuvet's got it. He's a good defensive first baseman, and he makes the play. Tyler Pitzer has been very good so far. We're going to go batter by batter with him here in the seventh inning with Miguel Uyola warming up in the bullpen. So he'll first face Kobe Mayo. He's going to hit one to the shortstop. That is Holiday, the new shortstop for us. He makes the play, one away. James Tibbs is up next. Tibbs hits one to Cuvet. Cuvet's got it. That is two away for Pitzer. And let's finish strong here, Pitzer, facing William Contreras. And he gets the check swing strikeout. Seven great innings from Tyler Pitzer here on opening day. Tamar Johnson will lead off versus Echeverria. And he will get on base yet again a leadoff walk. That brings up Chris Baker. Chris Baker is going to hit one to the outfield that does get through. Johnson going to third, and we have runners on the corners here with no outs. A scoring threat. A chance for insurance runs. Ezekiel Tovar is up next, and he will hit one. They will not get out of the infield. They come home with it, but uh, Tamar Johnson will be safe. So we do get a run. That's 3 nothing, and still two runners on base with no outs. Daniel Cuvet is up next, and he hammers one to left. There it is. That's what we want to see from Daniel Cuvet, who had a breakout year for us last year. He homers, and he breaks this game open 6-2-0. Zach Root is their new pitcher now. Mark Cox 
will be his first batter. And Cox is going to hit an infield pop-up, but it is too little too late, folks. We've already scored four runs in this inning. Next up is going to be Chris Greer. Oh, and Chris Greer hammers one, too. That's another home run for the Oakland A's. He shows up. Wow, 458 up in the second deck. Huge home run by Chris Greer. We now lead 7 to nothing. Andrew Wiggins up next. 3-1 pitch to him, and he is going to walk. He's trying to get a spot on this roster here. Ethan Holiday up next. Hasn't done much offensively for us, but he hits one to left field. Will it stay in? Will it stay in? It could go. It will go. It's an oppo bomb for Ethan Holiday. his first home run in an Oakland A's uniform. We are pouring it on right now. Seven runs in the bottom of the seventh. We lead 9-0. Well, with that in mind, no need to use any of these high leverage relievers. We're just going to call on Eric Segura the rest of the way, I believe. But let's get Connor Wong. Uh, let's see what his at-bat results in. A walk. Wow, this is just a meltdown. Tamar Johnson now. Uh, that ball gets away from Contreras, uh, but no advance. 3-1. Wow, we are just working every at bat. Doesn't matter that we're winning uh, nine to nothing. Chris Baker up next. Chris Baker hits one to right. Will it get down? Yes, it will. We are just gonna keep pouring it on and pouring it on here on opening day. And a run will come home. Actually, I think two runs will come home, and it'll be a triple for Chris Baker. Eleven to nothing now. Your score. We scored nine runs this inning, and actually, you know what? Let's make it ten. Ten runs this inning. And still only one out so far for Baltimore. Uh, now it's Daniel Cuvet's turn to hit oh, again. He's already homered. He strikes out. And it's going to be Mark Cox here with two outs. And he's going to hit one to left. And I think that's finally going to end the inning. But we score 10 runs this inning. We, la we now lead 12 to nothing. All right, Tyler Pitzer, great job. Obviously, we don't need you for any more. It's going to be Eric Segura for sure to close things out. And uh, unless... There's some really interesting goings on. We may just as well skip to the end here, although that is a leadoff single for uh, Kate Kirkland. All right, after a few more runs for each team, the score is 16-3 with two outs. Segura is still in to face Kate Kirkland. This should merely be a formality, though he does get plunked, so that does advance the runner to second. Okay, it's going to be Austin Coney up next, the 1-2 pitch, and that is going to be the strikeout. We clobber Baltimore 16-3, hopefully a sign of things to come. Here is your box score. Tamar Johnson led off and reached base five times, and we had homers from Cuvay, Cox Greer, and Ethan Holiday. Ethan Holiday, his first in an Oakland A's uniform. Tyler Pitzer is going to get a win in this one. It, it turns out to be a pretty easy win with Eric Segura simply in mop-up duty at the end there. And we will indeed start the season with a nice sweep of Baltimore. We outscore them 33-8. to We win all four of those games. We have a 4-0 record. And Ethan Holiday, who was below replacement level last year for Seattle, already has three home runs on the year. April 13th, we are 6-4 and four through our first 10 games of the season, and Dave Sochi is eligible to come off of the injured list. He suffered a day-to-day -day injury in spring training, and we decided to add him to the injured list. Andrew Wiggins so far is hitting 381, though, so I'm going to pull off a little nasty trick to hopefully avoid using an option on Sochi because Wiggins doesn't have any options, so it's basically either this or get DFA'd at this point. So I'm going to give Dave Sochi a rehab assignment, and I'm doing air quotes here to the minors. That'll give us at least 20 more days to decide what we want to do with those two. April 17th, Daniel Cuvet is injured with a delayed diagnosis that is diagnosis pending. We don't know what's going to happen here, but it could be season altering. We're going to move on to our next game, and he will be out for five weeks. Uh, we do get an achievement here for an extra base hit streak, but five-week injury for Daniel Cuvet. We're going to have to shuffle things around to make that work, but at least it's not a season ender by any means. So obviously we'll start by adding Cuvet to that injured list. And the call-up is going to be Danny Kennerly. We talked about depth some in the previous episode, and I definitely built up the depth of this team. Danny Kennerly has value for us, even if he wasn't that great of a hitter last year, because he is young, because he has options, and because he's simply a bat. I think he can be, you know, a league average hitter, and that's good as an injury replacement. So that's going to be Danny Kennerly replacing Daniel Cuvet for the next five weeks. It is now May 1st. We are a month into the season. We are 15 and 11. And so far, if there's any weakness so far, it is that bullpen. And we did seek to upgrade that bullpen some this offseason, but the results on that have been mixed. Cuvé is still out for three more weeks, and Kennerly has not really taken to that role well. But now it's time for us to reshuffle things around now that we're a month into the season. I've also tweaked the bullpen a little bit. Here's what it looks like now. We don't have that much depth. I guess Salcedo and AAA would be the guy to call up if one of these guys really, really struggles and just can't be a big league relief option at all. 
And then you're probably wondering about catcher. Carter Jensen has been perfectly fine so far, a 94 OPS plus in the majors on pace for one war as sort of a platoon option. It's him and Connor Wong. Connor Wong serving the role of the captain on this team. You're probably wondering about Jared Forrest, who is the heir apparent, certainly our future franchise catcher, especially after trading Luis Castellanos. Not quite ready to make his big league debut. He has a 97 OPS plus in AAA. I'd like to see that above 100. I'd like to see that well above 100, but the ratings have come along. He's obviously a fantastic defensive catcher. He could win gold gloves at the catcher position. I'm excited about him, but it's not just yet his time. And then finally, some good news. Chris Greer is your American League Rookie of the Month. He hit eight home runs in April, and I wonder if he will be a contender for Rookie of the Year this season. Also, as I already predicted, it is indeed AAA time for Mike Drake. He has a .74 ERA through four starts in AA. He's ready for AAA. He's probably ready for the majors, but uh, there is not an open rotation spot for him yet. So here's how we're going to line up for now versus right. It's going to be a lot of lefties, and the threat here would basically be someone could put in a lefty reliever right at about this point in the lineup and really start to shut things down for us. But versus left-handed pitching, it's fun. It's interesting. We're having fun. Jeremy Okoro is here. Vance Honeycutt, we're going to give him starts in center field. Kick Chris Baker over to right to give Tamar Johnson DH days, which is nice because he is wrecked. May 17th, we are 21-18. and 18. The bad news is Daniel Cuvé has a setback in terms of his recovery from the sprained ankle, so it'll be another one to two weeks until he's ready. The good news, Chris Greer is your American League Rookie of the Week, so he's just going off right now, pacing for 46 homers in a 900 OPS season. May 28th, we are hot. We have won eight in a row, and we are currently tied for first place in the division in what has been a very competitive division early on here in 2032. These are some strong teams we're going up against here, but we currently are tied for first place with the Texas Rangers thanks to a sweep we just did where we won 5-1, to 63-2 and two to nothing as part of our eight-game win streak. And when you're hot, why not try to get hotter? Because Carter Jensen has slowed down here. He currently has a 600 OPS on the season. I think it is time to send him down to AAA. He has one more remaining option. And I think you know who the call-up is going to be. It is going to be Jared Forrest, of course, our 2030 first round draft pick. He's currently the number 30 ranked prospect in the game, 23 years old, an elite defensive catcher. Bat's still a work in progress, but he is now in Oakland A. Ooh, and how about some more good news? Because Daniel Cuvet is finally ready to come back from his sprained ankle. He's only played 14 games this year. He's got some catching up to do. But this is very good news for everyone, except for Andrew Wiggins, who's going to be DFA'd again. So that means the lineups will indeed look like this going forwards. I do want to shout out Tyler Pitzer yet again. Wins in his last four starts and just picking up right where he left off in 2031 with a 2.40 ERA. June 1st is a good time for a prospect check-in, but before that, how about the fact we've won 11 in a row and currently hold a two-game lead in the American League West? Things are looking pretty good. So it indeed is prospect check-in time. I'm sure among the rookie ballers, you'll want to see Juan Bustillos. He's off to a terrific start of the season in Arizona. That is great. We've been waiting for him to get hot. He is 20 years old. I wonder if he could finish the season in full season A ball. Moving on here into A and high A, Jimmy Luman is someone who you've decided to give the demotion, or excuse me, promotion from uh, the Arizona Complex League to uh, single A Stockton. So he is moving into full season ball. I think he's probably profiling more as a reliever in the long term, but he is currently a starter for now. Any other interesting names here in A? Not really, not really. I guess we could check in on Alexis Kaye. We were once really excited about him. He is making his full season A debut, and it has not been particularly good. Damani Harrison is someone who has gotten a promotion up to high A. Uh, the Lansing Lugnuts, he was off to a great start in A ball. This is his uh, represents his full season A debut. So he is, he is 22 years old, but it's good to get a promotion already in your full season uh, debut. One guy I'm starting to become excited about a little bit is Dakota Ralston, who is a relief prospect we drafted in 2030, a fifth rounder. He has just continued to perform no matter what. He has a 1.69 ERA in high A this year, and he's young. He's only 20 years old. Moving in here to double A, I've decided to demote Daniel Arana and promote Liddell Hungo, and I'll show you why. So Daniel Arana was our 2029 first rounder. Just hasn't developed with the bat, has not performed as far as a hitter in AAA at all whatsoever. And I think at 25 years old, he's basically just someone we're going to have to move on from at the deadline. Hopefully we can train for someone who helps us at the big league level. And then replacing him essentially is Liddell Hungo, who is also a you know left-handed hitting, glove first, shortstop. 
He just straight up looks better. Like, he has 60 power potential. That is something he was tearing up double A. He was a 20 36 runner for us, so not even a guy I drafted, you know, on screen, but uh, he has turned out great so far. He has continued to develop, and I think he could be, you know, a piece for us. I don't know if that's just as a utility infielder. We'll see, but uh, Mauricio Alboran, I will point out, is injured as far as the uh, depth chart goes for middle infield. Pete Barker's a guy I like. I kind of suspect he's better than Segura in some way. Like maybe we end up non-tendering or trading Segura and we just call it Pete Barker. He's a great sort of SP6, SP7 depth guy, having a great start to his year in AAA. He was in that Vinny Pasquantino trade. Treviso, I've moved up to uh, AAA after a great start to a season in double. I'm a big fan of his, but I just don't know where he fits in necessarily in the outfield. He could be a guy we look to move on from at some point. And uh, Mike Drake, who you probably want to know about, probably uh, the guy who has a chance to make an impact on the rotation. Well, the rotation's been pretty good for us this year, and his ERA is currently 7. So we're pumping the brakes a little bit. Keep in mind, he is only 21 years old. June 5th here, we are 35 and 23, and I will point out that Andrew Wiggins has cleared waivers, so he is still in our organization. June 8th here, 36 and 25 is our record. We are currently half a game behind the Texas Rangers for the division lead, and we also hold a wild card spot. Kevin Skeet has a day to day injury that is a sore shoulder for one week. It influences throwing moderates, which makes me suspect that would influence his ability to, for example, pitch. That's not great. His ERA is over five on the season. It hasn't been the greatest of rookie starts for him so far. We're going to play it safe with him. We are going to add him to the 10-day injured list in light of this day-to-day injury, or excuse me, 15-day injured list, so he will miss a, a couple starts. And we're going to call up Pete Barker to make his debut in the rotation. He deserves it, after all. A 3.21 ERA in the high-scoring run environment of Las Vegas is very impressive. Welcome to the big leagues, Pete Barker. And he will respond with a win, six innings of two-run ball versus the Cincinnati Reds. Obviously, the team is doing well, but one guy we'd like to see get going is, in fact, Daniel Cuvet, who had a breakout 2031. I don't want him to go the way of Josh Mears and just have that be his one good season. Still a lot to play for him so far. He's only played 25 games. June 24th, we are 44-29. and 29. That ties us for first place in the very competitive AOS. As you can see, these four teams, all very good, all vying for wildcard spots, if not the division lead. I do want to give a quick shout-out to Dave Sochi. Dave Sochi off to a nice start for us. I'm glad he's part of our long-term plans, as well as Mark Cox. Mark Cox, I knew he could be an everyday big league player. I didn't think he'd be this good. Kevin Skeed is eligible to come off of the injured list. Pete Barker did a great job. Three games started a 2.76 ERA, and I think we won all three of the games he started, so that's great. He has given me something to think about, but we are going to send him down to AAA and put Kevin Skeed back in the rotation. I am also going to make the decision to waive and DFA Dylan Watts. This is someone who is ARB eligible and is earning $1.7 million on the year for us. And as you can see, since we traded for him from the Arizona Diamondbacks, he just hasn't really performed. His ERA in an Oakland A's uniform is about 7, which is not very good. Let's actually see what it is. 7.29. That's not very good for Dylan Watts. I think the main culprit here is that 45 home run allowed on the 20 to 80 scale. That's never really going to get it done. I would want to to avoid a 45 at pretty much all costs so we're going to wave and dfa him and the corresponding move will not be pete barker although that might be the smarter move it's going to be tim salcedo so we're going to bring in tim salcedo back in the big leagues for now here is our mid-season review of goals from john fisher overall he's very happy with the team record which is most important he says seems like the team is well on its way to another playoff appearance that implies that i've been part of another playoff appearance which i have not He's not happy with our efforts to improve stolen bases. Haven't done that. Haven't acquired an MVP winner, and I don't think that's something we're going to prioritize necessarily. Increased attendance he is happy with, although fan interest could be higher, but the attendance is there. And uh, still nothing from our international amateur fines, and it's true. It's true. We traded away Luis Castellanos, and as a whole, we have not gotten really anything from IFA signing so far, at least at the big league level. July 1st, and our scout has delivered us a nice scouting report on both Dave Sochi, who has his ratings improve, as well as Jeremy Okoro potential ratings improving. So that is a good sign. That gives me hope for the long-term efforts of our corner outfield, especially because I could see us moving on from Tamar Johnson at some point in the offseason. He's been good for us again this year. 388 OBP is a 388 OBP. Doesn't matter really how you do it. We like guys who get on base. We are the Oakland A's after all. But his injury proneness is wrecked. And you can see his contract looks like that. So I wouldn't mind moving on from him, especially with the knowledge that Okoro and Sochi are good enough in the corner outfield. 
July 11th is draft day. We will indeed finish this episode with the draft. But first of all, just a quick midseason check-in. We are 52 and 36. We have a one and a half game lead over the Texas Rangers in the very competitive AL West. I would say our greatest strength so far has been the offense. The offense has been really good. We're fifth in OPS in the American League. And that's particularly impressive because we really play in a pitcher's park. If there's one weakness, potentially it would be the bullpen. But truthfully, our stoppers, Chris Pereira, David Rivera, and Miguel Uyola, have been great in terms of the run prevention. It's just been the middle relievers, the bridge to those stoppers that have been difficult. Rotation has been good. It's slowed down a little bit. Caminiti's ERA is over 5. Skeets is around 5. Jared Jones with a 4.45. This is his last year. And honestly, we'll be fine to let him go. Mike Drake and Chris Rangel are waiting in the wings. Uh, but uh, Brent Renfro, in his first season as an Oakland A has been great. We trade for him this past offseason. And then Tyler Pitzer has continued to do Tyler Pitzer things. We will be picking 13th in the draft this year. That has a slot value of about $6 million. I think we have the ability to go over slot if someone really interests us, but we'll just have to see who is available. Here are your first few picks of the draft. The Baltimore Orioles had two of them, including Juan Vela, who was the first high school hitter off the board and first player overall, as well as Genjo Uchiyama, who was the first college hitter off the board. I really wanted him, but I knew he wasn't going to be available. Interesting setup here at pick number 13. Our best available player, at least according to our scout, is Chad Forte. He's a high school bat, 85 power potential, but I don't like the 40 avoid Ks, and I really don't like the fact that it doesn't sound like he can, he can properly field an outfield position. He's more of a first base DH only type. If I was looking for a first base DH only type, I might also look at Arnie Krant, who is uh, another big power, great offensive stats across the board, a little more balanced offensively, high school hitter, but it comes with a much higher demand at $9.5 million and that is well over slot. Chris Yelder is a very good pitcher who's available, but I have an aversion to pitching, or excuse me, picking a high school pitcher in the first round to begin with. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just not going to learn my lesson. I'm not going to learn my lesson at all. I'm going to draft another college bat. I'm going to draft another, you know, glove first infielder, and that is going to be Steve DeBona, a 21-year-old uh, college hitter. Looks like he could be a league average-ish hitter with just insanely good defense at shortstop, and that's kind of what I want all the time. He's a switch hitter as well. We did not learn our lesson from Daniel Arana. We did not learn our lesson from the fact that we have guys that are at least somewhat similar to this in the system. I'm going to pick Steve DeBona. That's going to be uh, my pick in the first round here of 2032. Second round right here, and it's mostly high school hitters as far as I can tell. That's what I'm really considering here, high school bats. And I think the best available is going to be Jesus Mayorga, a shortstop out of New Jersey. He has great, just very balanced hitting profile across the board, although highlighted by power and eye potential. And what I really like here is the defense, because even though he's listed as a shortstop, what he clearly profiles as is a third baseman and a very good one at that. So I would be excited for Jesus Mayorga the most out of all of these high school bats available. And so I'm going to pick him in the second round. Third round here, I'm going to go with a high school pitcher by the name of Kevin Lewin. Definitely stuff oriented across the board. His changeup is his best pitch, at least potentially. Uh, but yeah, not that great in terms of the movement or the control, kind of the opposite of what I would normally look for. I'd look for probably movement as the highest priority, but at the very least, he does have a 55 home run allowed potential. So I'm going to pick Kevin Lewin here in the third round. Fourth round here, I'm going to go with Eric Finch. This is another high school pitcher, and I like that he has the control potential. That's really what I need is probably more control in the rotation, if anything. A long way to go with any high school pitcher, a lot of variability, but I'm willing to take that risk in the fourth round. And we'll round things out in the fifth here by drafting Pat Sivert, a college bat. First base DH only, but I do like the contact and power potential across the board. I will grab him in the fifth round. And that will end our episode, folks. Thanks for tuning in. This was a big episode for us. I will see you for part two at the All-Star break.